Welcome to Grace. We're so happy you've chosen to worship with us on this third Sunday in our Advent season as we continue to wait and prepare for God with us, Emmanuel. If you're with us for the first time or the 50th time, we'd love to know that you're here by clicking on the registration. Today, the Duncan family will add the light of the rose-colored candle to our Advent wreath, the candle of joy, and we invite you to light three candles as well, either on your own wreath or on any you may have close at hand as we celebrate the candle liturgy. It's hard to believe it's already the third week in Advent. We're less than two weeks from Christmas, and I know that to be true because I've never seen so many delivery trucks in my life. It's still a very busy time of year, even if the family gatherings and social events are off the table. Are you realizing joy, not just in the season, but in your life? It might seem more elusive this year, and it's easy to confuse joy with happiness, but scripture tells us they're not the same. Happiness comes and goes, but joy is a state of being despite one's circumstances because of the grace of Jesus Christ that lives in us. God came through Christ to be with us, to bring peace, to be love, to share hope, to take sin and to conquer the grave. Thank you for joining us on this journey to the manger. As we draw ever near to Christmas Eve, you'll want to visit our website, peopleofgrace.org, to learn about what Christmas Eve will look like this year. It is a Christmas like no other, and staying home from church is the way we show our love for each other this year. So we've been working very hard as a staff to bring Grace Christmas to you. There will be two online worship services offered for viewing at the time most convenient for you and your family. One is a more casual homespun Christmas with worship elements from children through adults, lots of familiar faces, as so many of our choir members offered up recordings from their homes to be part of our virtual choir. There will also be the beauty of the traditional lessons and carols. I'm planning to watch the first in the afternoon with a cup of hot cocoa by the tree, and we'll plan for lessons and carols after the Christmas dinner dishes are done in the stillness of peace of the late evening. And the very special ad this year is the Christmas Luminary drive through on the expansive property of Grace. So be sure to plan church into your Christmas Eve just like you would have if this would have been a normal year. And the beauty of these online offerings is that you can watch with others from anywhere. Create a Facebook watch party for your family. And remember to share the gift of worship with others. It's as easy as sharing the web address or sending in an email in a link. Just think of how many more people can enjoy Christmas Eve worship this year. So share the good news. It all starts at the website, the place for all of this information, as well as the place to share prayer requests, financially support the many ongoing ministries, and to learn more about what's going on in the life of grace now and after Christmas Eve. But for now, come, let's worship together as the Duncan family leads us in the Advent Candle Liturgy. In the past, God spoke through the prophets in many times and many ways. But in these final days, God spoke to us through a son. The son is the light of God's glory and the imprint of God's being. We light the third Advent candle as a sign that God is with us, bringing light and joy amid every conceivable darkness. Come what may, we are not alone. We wait, we hope, trusting that the one born to Mary is fully God. Jesus, you are Emmanuel. Who is like you, God most high, drawing near to those who are low and in need to raise them up? We thank you that you have not left us alone, but that in your son Jesus, you came to be with us as one of us. May we sense you near us even now through your spirit, May we take heart in our darkest and most fearful times, trusting that you abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. And by your grace, may others know through what we do that God is with them. Amen.
I invite you to pray with me. God of love, we come to you with praise on our lips. We are so grateful that you are the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and end, and that your love for us knows no bounds. Help us to hold the knowledge of that love close to us as we continue our journey toward the celebration of your birth. The journey feels different this year for so many reasons. Traditions are uprooted and many of us will be alone for Christmas. We are mourning the loss of lives, broken relationships, lack of financial security, and the once taken for granted ability to gather and hug dear family and friends. Our country is full of unrest as we grapple with what it looks like to live in community with each other. Help us to love each other as you taught us and emulated for us. We rejoice in the truth that you came in human form to live among us so that we may have eternal life. We look with hope toward the day when Christ's peace will reign in our hearts, our homes, our communities, and our world. We lift up the peacemakers, those who are dedicating their lives to building bridges of love. We look to you as the Prince of Peace to kindle in our hearts a true love of peace. Remind us that we will only experience true internal peace by knowing you and loving you. Help us to be faithful to the path you have set for us. Make us instruments of your love that your name may be hallowed, your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she 
Aries, was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all, now all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Hello, I'm Susan Hoover, and I'm here this today with my darling granddaughter, Ellen, who will read the scripture. Merry Christmas, I'm Ellen Hoover, and today I will be reading a letter from the Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the past, God spoke through the prophets to our ancestors in many times and many ways. In these final days, though he spoke to us through a son, God made his son the heir of everything and created the world through him. The sun is the light of God's glory and the imprint of God's being. He maintains everything with his powerful message. After he carried out the cleansing of people from their sins, he sat down at the right side of the highest majesty. Hello. I hope you've been enjoying the church-wide book read during these first few weeks of Advent. Uh, together we're reading Adam Hamilton's new book, Incarnation, Rediscovering the Significance of Christmas. And each chapter, you'll notice, explores a different name or title for Jesus that comes up during this Christmas season. In chapter 1, Hamilton reminded us of the important distinction between our earthly rulers and Jesus as our King or Lord. It's all about our priorities, is Hamilton's major takeaway. Hamilton concludes that chapter, that first chapter, with a pointed call to faithful discipleship. I don't know your politics, he writes, but if you are Christian, I know your king. His Sermon on the Mount, his parables, and his great commandments calling us to love God and neighbor represent the laws of his kingdom. Our allegiance to him comes above all other allegiances. You'll find that on pages 41 and 42 of the book. Last week, Hamilton helped us take a closer look at that familiar passage from the Gospel of Matthew, where the angel appears to Joseph in a dream and declares that the child born to him shall be named Jesus, which we learn means he saves. Pastor Cindy introduced her sermon last week with the most important question then, what do we mean when we say Jesus saves? Pastor Cindy helped us reflect on how Jesus saves us, not only from our own sin, those times when we fall short of the holiness that God desires for us, uh, Cindy reminding us that the Greek word for sin means to miss the mark, but also saves us from a hopeless and meaningless life, one that ends with death and nothing else but memory. The name of Jesus, he saves, illuminates his birth and foreshadows his sacrifice, proclaiming that nothing, not even death, can separate us from God's love. In our chapter today, on this third Sunday of Advent, we read from the very same chapter in Matthew, but just a verse or two further. Here we discover another name for Jesus, but this time Matthew draws from the ancient writings of the prophet Isaiah. And they shall name this child Emmanuel, which means God with us. Curiously, this name, Emmanuel, God is with us, is not used very much in the Gospels. In fact, this is the only place that it appears but it expresses a profound belief in the relationship between Jesus and God that clearly inspired the early disciples and that has certainly endured through the centuries. So our question for this week 
becomes, what do we mean when we say God is with us? What do we mean when we say God is with us? This year, after all we've been through, this question has a new sense of urgency, at least for me. I imagine it does for you. And Hamilton knows that. His chapter on Emmanuel, God with us, considers that name in light of the ongoing pandemic. There's been no shortage of Christian responses to this virus ranging across the theological spectrum. Some popular preachers have presented the pandemic as God's punishment for any number of societal sins. But our mainline theologians, the notable ones that uh, make the media, such as the Anglican Bishop N.T. Wright and the American scholar and pastor Walter Brueggemann, whose work we read this summer, point out that the gospel, the good news, is about God's presence, not punishment. The God we celebrate on Christmas, the God revealed through the birth of Jesus, does not bring suffering and death, but life and hope. Or as John wrote, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Christmas, the birth of God incarnate, embodied, enfleshed in Jesus, proclaims our God's commitment to being with us, present with us in this life, with us even in our own suffering and death. We're invited to pray on that today, to reflect on the significance of that belief. We Christians believe that the creator of heaven and earth, of all that ever was, is, and ever will be, chose to walk with us through this life and still walks with us today. As Hamilton puts it, in Jesus, God experienced what we experience as humans. Temptation, love, hunger, joy, fear and friendship, grief and doubt, rejection, a sense of abandonment even by God, and death itself. He wept, he bled, he suffered, he died. So when you come to God pouring out your heart, asking for help, or praying for forgiveness, you pray to one who knows, who understands what it is to be fallible, frail, and fearful. This is the power of the Incarnation. This is the power of Emmanuel, God with us. What a transformative reflection. Hamilton writes beautifully about how his own experience of God's presence with him has changed his life. He writes, because I believe God is with me, I live differently. I have peace. I find strength. I live seeking to walk with him. And there's a crucial point that he doesn't explore a whole lot, but he certainly opens the door and invites us to do a little further reflecting. To proclaim that God is with us is a belief that not only provides peace and strength for our lives, but also a model for how to live our lives. For these reasons, the Anglican priest and author Samuel Wells writes that with is the most important word in the Christian faith. With is the most important word in the Christian faith. It defines our very image of God and our most it defines our very image of God and our understanding of discipleship. He writes, in the Trinity, we see the eternal persons, Creator, Son, Holy Spirit, being with each other. In the Gospels, we see Jesus being with the people he encounters, mediating God's grace to them with his own incarnational presence. Those in ministry are likewise, and that's not just the ordained ministry, he means here 
disciples, those who minister in the world, those in ministry are likewise called to the task of being with, with God, with the church, and with the created world and those who dwell in it. That goes beyond humans as well. God's presence with us gives us peace and strength, but also direction and purpose. God with us is both an immense comfort and a lifelong challenge. A challenge to be with God in return, that is, to live out or put into practice this incarnational theology of ours, this belief in Emmanuel, God with us. The early followers of Jesus witnessed to Emmanuel, God's presence among us, when they decided, not without much debate, to accept Gentiles, non-Jewish peoples, into the Good Shepherd's flock, proclaiming that we are all one in Christ Jesus. Historians agree that the early church grew in part because of the Christian care for the forgotten poor, Emmanuel in action. John Wesley and the early Methodists witnessed to Emmanuel when they preached in the fields, choosing to be with the poor and disenfranchised, unable to go into the church. They embodied Emmanuel as they championed education, cared for widows and orphans, visited prisoners, and preached against the evils of slavery. American Methodists witnessed to Emmanuel when they formed the Committee on Relief in 1940, now a global humanitarian organization that addresses hunger, poverty, health care, and sustainability in over 80 countries and among immigrants and refugees. Methodists witnessed to Emmanuel when they voted to ordain women to the ministry in 1956, and when they marched against racial segregation and for civil rights in the 1960s. How do we witness to Emmanuel today? As Adam Hamilton points out, the pandemic has many of us hungering for presence more than ever. Perhaps we appreciate the power of with now more than ever. Called to incarnate the love of God for our neighbor, Grace supported healthcare professionals and essential workers cooked meals for Hesed House and collected donations for food pantries, distributed school snacks and supplies to local families, and shared cards and phone calls with members longing for community, all while maintaining safe social distance. Being with is not just about being next to. But while the pandemic will end, the power of with will not. Even as we dream about our lives soon returning to normal, our Christian connection reminds us that normal is a burden for many of our brothers and sisters here and around the world. So how will God with us move us to be with them, to advocate for them, not out of some political agenda, but because with is what we do? Presence is what we're all about. I believe opportunities to embody, to incarnate the love of God abound at Grace Church. We can grow our hunger missions, expanding our commitment to the Hesed House, Loaves and Fishes, and Feed My Starving Children. We can be a powerful voice within this conference, within our community, advocating for the full inclusion of LGBTQ persons within the ministries of the United Methodist Church. We can support and engage with our Commission on Religion and Race, educating ourselves about systemic racism, advocating for change, and finding ways to support people of color here at Grace and in Naperville. We can jump in with our Committee on Church and Society, as they help us to appreciate our connection with God's creation, identifying ways that we can pursue environmental justice and economic sustainability. 
These are important ways of being with those who often produce much of the food that we enjoy. This is where it happens, where we witness to Emmanuel, God with us, by being fully present for and with others. And yes, as Adam Hamilton points out, we only find the courage and strength to continue on this journey in the assurance that God is indeed with us and will be with us even to the end of the age. Thanks be to God and amen. As we go forward from this time together, perhaps it's out into the world to work, to uh, shop for groceries, um, perhaps it's staying at home, but reaching out into the world um, by phone, by email, uh, by letters written in our own hand. In whatever we do, let us witness to Emmanuel, God with us. Not only in the historical person of Jesus, God made flesh in that moment of time and in that part of the world, but God present with us today. 
Let us embrace that challenge to incarnate the love of God for others, even as we feel God's presence giving us the peace and the strength to do so. So brothers and sisters in Christ, let us go forward to love and serve the Lord. Amen.